Good morning. <clears throat> Want to uh, thank our uh, praise team for uh, just uh, leading us and filling our hearts with uh, joy and allowing us to worship our great God and letting us express some joy even on a cloudy, rainy day. But we need the rain, so God is good. And uh, it's like that song, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, some days you're not happy. You know, if you had a picnic planned today, you may not be real happy. But we're joyful that God cares enough for us to, um, to give us this rain. I know our outside of our house really needs it, and I'm sure yours does as well. So the Lord's on his throne. He knows what he is doing. Well, we're on the... Uh, <clears throat> the cusp, the near the beginning of uh, another uh, new day in the life of Fairview Church. Uh, as Alan mentioned, that starting next week, uh, we're going to move forward to uh, two worships, 8.30 and 11. And um, I think that our 11 o'clock, we really want to converge our worship services and, um, and really have an expression of praising God each and every week. You know, when I, about 11 years ago, I was going through a first major surgery because I had some cancer in my neck area and jaw area, and I had to go through about six weeks of um, radiation, a few chemotherapy treatments. You know, it was a weary time. One thing that really built me up, of course, was prayer, people praying for me, friends and colleagues and acquaintances I had met through different congregations, through missions around the world, and that was uplifting. There was a group of, um, of people, I think they were mostly ladies, from, I believe it was Franklin Baptist Church, and they had a quilting ministry, and it was really neat, and what they would do is they would make quilts for those who were really in a long time of uh, illness or at least recovering and so I don't know why we received so many but maybe we received about three two two churches but maybe three quilts right three or four see I don't have so long ago but like four quilts and uh, they were very special I think Amanda kept one and uh, we have a couple that are in the den now I, you know I, mine's been such a favorite blankie that <laughs> you know, it's it's getting a little worn, and uh, uh, but it was so neat. And I I thought about quilting. Um, I think historically, a, a quilt is very meaningful, especially to family. And for a long time, they were almost like fairly family heirlooms. You know, you would have the patches in the quilt would tell a story, and you may have some patches that went back generations and other patches that were just a one generation ago and in some patches of reminders of today and and maybe even some patches of of new birth of a son or daughter or grandson granddaughter of the generations going forward and you know that's kind of one way that i see worship in our day and time in the era that we live and probably worship uh, throughout the centuries is that worship has its ancient components. You know, we, we worship and we'll have some ancient, ancient parts of our worship today. Uh, a few, like communion is an ancient worship practice, isn't it? Given to us by our Lord. And it has those things that we don't want to let go of and we still incorporate in our worship. And, um, then there are, I would say, some very important historical parts of worship that we have uh, in our worship services, those, those things that are make us distinct uh, in our own culture, uh, going back in our own country, uh, probably even some things we still do from the 1700s and 1800s, and we just don't know about it. And they are so important, and they're woven into this quilt of worship that we bring up to God. Uh, and then there are some new things, and there are some uh, new ways of worship. Uh, there 
are always new ideas from God's people of how to worship him and lift him up. And, and uh, we are, uh, now as the current body of Christ, it's all, we have a responsibility and, and we, uh, we also have the joy of incorporating some new types of worship to add to this ancient history, this historical history of worship. And as we add that to what has gone on before us, we are, think of it as weaving a beautiful cloth, weaving together a, a beautiful quilt of worship, of praise to God. And that's really how I feel about that. So today I want us to, to talk about the second part of worship. Last, last week we said we need to worship in spirit and truth. And this week I want you to turn to Psalm 150. That's a high psalm, isn't it? In fact, it's the last one. It's the last psalm. You know, I, I know that maybe those of us here who have been believers a long time or a short time, and we really love reading our Bible, we love reading devotions every day, I'm sure you are like me that the Psalms are just one of, it's one of our favorite books of the Bible. I mean, what a, what a symbol of ancient worship that is still so current today. And you know, the Psalms are filled with maybe every human emotion, every human struggle, um, every, uh, every uh, human encounter with the Lord God that almost can be imagined. There's, there's confession in the Psalms. There's pleading in the Psalms. There are those that are sick and ill and are praying and crying out to God to save them and heal them. Uh, you know, there is pure praise and worship in the Psalms. There's prophecy in the Psalms in the Psalms about what is to come and even points to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It is such a web a, uh, of, of emotion and theology, and it's many of our favorite books, and it's my favorite book, one of them in the Scripture. You can go and just pray through these Psalms. And so it's no coincidence that as the authors of and the collectors of this poetry, of these hymns, of these laments came together and they said, what do we put at the end of this book? <laughs> what, uh, what's the main message? Uh, what, what do the people of the earth need to remember when lifting up the name of God? What's, uh, or what's one of our sole purposes for being created in the first place? And what do we do once, once people find that relationship with God again? And of all of those different themes that they could have ended this great book with, Psalm 150, here's how they chose to end it. Listen to this short but beautiful psalm, and then we'll look at it a little closer this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's how they chose to end this book of worship of singing, of what's deepest in our hearts that needs to come out and be expressed to God. And so I think that it answers several questions of worship, the main questions of why we worship. First of all, it answers the question of where, where are the people of God supposed to worship? Where are the people of God supposed to come and praise him? And it begins, praise the Lord. And first of all, praise God in his sanctuary. For the folk of this day and time, it was to praise God in the temple 
or praise God in the synagogues that were, part, were, were cropping up all over uh, now the world because of uh, the dispersion of the people. For us, it's, it's praise the Lord is the importance of coming together as believers and praising God together, right? It's corporate worship. It's, it's finding the local church, the local congregation, the local small group. But one thing that it says to me is that we're not to praise God in isolation. We're not to, to praise God only now, sometimes when we're sick or at home on a Sunday morning or, or laid up for a while, maybe it's good to turn on the radio, turn on the TV, catch a good message, hear a good devotional. But we are created, we're built, we're made to come together to lift up many voices as one to praise the Lord. The one place where to praise God is together. Why, do, why is it so important? Why is it in your soul to come to church on a rainy Sunday morning? Because God is worth praising together as one voice. But other than that, it's not the only place we're to praise him. We're to praise him, the psalm says, in his mighty heavens. In other words, we are to praise God together, but we are to be thinking of God, lifting up God, praising God wherever we are, whoever we are with. We praise God when we gather in small groups of believers for, to look at his word and Bible study or to share prayer concerns and pray with one another. We're to praise God. I know many of you have told me, I mean, how many riding around town listen to the, a Christian radio station or maybe pop in your uh, your favorite, I'll just anybody use CDs anymore, <laughs> or, to, or to link up your, your iPhone, uh, CDs, there's a CD man, or maybe to stream, you know, some music from your iPhone, you know, into your speaker system of your, of your favorite sacred music. But, you know, we're, we're to praise God when we're by ourselves. We're to praise God as a family. We are to think and praise God and worship him in those moments when we are out in nature, when we see his great creation, when we're moved by his power and by his might. So that has its place too. We're to praise God together. We're to praise God everywhere. That's what the psalm was how they wanted to finish this psalm, is that above everything, even in our cries for mercy, even in our cries for uh, confession and forgiveness, we're to always be praising the Lord. I love that last praise song that we sing, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When things are going right, when things are not, we still bless God. So where do we praise God? Together, but everywhere. Together, but separate. We're to praise God all the time. And why do we praise him? Why do we praise God? That's the next question. That second verse says, praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Uh, praise him for his acts of power. Throughout these psalms, many of these psalms lift up God as the only God, the powerful God, the God of creation the God of saving acts that saves mankind, uh, the God that's above all others, the God that um, created the mountains with his steps in the earth as he formed them, uh, the God that spoke this world into order and to creation, the God of which there is no other, and we're not to give our allegiance to any other type of God. It's the God that's all-knowing, the God that's everywhere, uh, the God that's all full of love, uh, the God that, um, that brings all history together, both on this end of eternity and this end. We're to praise God for his power and might and a God that can do anything that he wants to with his creation, a God who we are at his mercy and then we're to praise him for his surpassing greatness. And one reason we come together 
and this part of the tapestry and this part of the quilting and the ancient as the ancient meets uh, the the past and as ancient meets the present because we can see on the other side of this psalm we come and we praise this great powerful mighty God who chose to do what come to us we come and praise this God that lowered himself in the form of a human being Paul says in Philippians and came as the person the man of Jesus Christ we praise this mighty and powerful God for stooping down to our level for a while that we may be raised up and be friends of God that we can be sons and daughters of God, that we can find eternal salvation. We praise, we worship the why? Because of what God has done for us. And we know God, what God has done for us is the mighty, powerful God we see in the Old Testament, but we really see what God has done for us in the loving Father that sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth will not perish, but have eternal life. That's why we come and worship. We were the why of worship is Jesus. The why of worship is because God and His Son Jesus, through His Son Jesus Christ, deserves our worship. That's the reason. And so we know the what, and we know the why, and and so how do we go about praising? How do we go about worshiping such a great God? How do we go about worshiping such a great God with a great love and an immeasurable eternal grace? Well, we worship him with all that we have. That's how. We don't hold anything back, do we? And in, in the psalm this day, it begins, they praised him with everything. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. It gives us the picture of, of the people gathering for worship, and it's like this beautiful orchestra or this beautiful band beginning to play, and a few little instruments start and the trumpets start and, and then uh, the strings join in and uh, then the lyre joins in and then more strings and pipe uh, join in and then the percussion comes in with banging cymbals and I'm sure pounding drums until it's this image of this crescenting noise growing and growing and being lifted up to the mighty God. And voices, can you just see them singing these songs and these psalms and how those voices raise up? And it's worshiping him with everything that the church has to offer. And so if we have those gifted with the guitar, they need to lift that guitar up in praise. If we have those in our congregation gifted with the bass, they, it needs to be included in our worship. If we have those gifted in percussion and drums and cymbals, they need to be included in our worship. And organ and piano, it needs to be included in our worship. Not because we like it or don't like it, because we're commanded to bring everything we have to God. All that we have. Why well, have somebody with a gift that can, that can praise and worship God and say, no, that's good, but we can't use you here. That's not me. That's not how I see the scripture. That's not how, what the psalmist said. We worship him with everything. I was reading about these verses this week, and, and it was interesting that, you know, that uh, worship him, praise him with the harp and lyre. At this time, the the harp and lyre were kind of new instruments being introduced to the worship of that day. And it said that many of the traditional worshipers of the day of the psalm, even when this was written, that kind of the harp and the lyre weren't really 
part of the accepted instruments in corporate worship in the temple, uh, in the synagogue, because they were kind of seen as the common person's instruments. You know, the, the harp was something the shepherd boy played out watching the sheep. Uh, the lyre was something that maybe played in the cottage or the home and, and really wasn't part of corporate worship. But the psalmist says, doesn't matter. <laughs> you bring it all because when we worship together, God is worthy uh, because of who he is and what he's done for us. You bring it all together to worship the Lord. And so, who is to praise? Who is to worship the Lord? Verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> That's how the ancient writers decided to end this great book where they could have chosen every theme. They said, let everyone who has breath praise God. Praise the Lord. For word of praise and word of worship God with all that we are and with all that we have. I truly believe that, don't you? And uh, that's kind of an eternal truth of Scripture I'm willing to stand on and stand by. And I will. And I hope that you will, too. That every Sunday we come together and give all that we are and all that we have to worship the Lord. One way we do that, and like I said in the beginning, one of the ancient symbols, one of the ancient acts of worship that has just stood the, stood the test of time, has uh, stood the, uh, the, the ministry, the worship of time, is communion, isn't it? What a powerful symbol. What, uh, what symbols of bread and, and cup that, that remind us of the who that we worship and the why that we worship. It reminds us of the great links that God went to to bring us back, to be the loving Father that looks for us down the road every day. It's the beautiful symbol that, that reminds us that what it took, sending and sacrificing His only Son, Jesus, for us. And the length of that sacrifice, right? He had to suffer and die a terrible death on the cross to take care of our sin. And he had to shed his own blood and give his life so that death could be defeated along with sin and that we could live again. That's the ancient worship that meets with today's culture. That never changes. That's the cradle. That's what's in the cradle. That will never change, isn't it? So I'm going to invite you that know Christ as Savior to, to come and, and, and partake of communion and, and to go back and just pray and thank God and worship him for what he's done. And, um, and then we'll, we'll have a song, a song of invitation. We have another baptism coming up, praise God. A little boy coming up here in a few weeks. And, and uh, maybe, maybe you're here Easter and saw those baptisms. Maybe you've been thinking about asking Christ in your heart give you a chance to do that like we do every Sunday or to join our church become a member uh, I'll give you a chance to do that as well and when we begin singing after communion but let's uh, let's just worship let's pray but let's just do this act of worship together and uh, experience communion together and remember the who that we worship and the why and where we are today let's pray Lord Jesus, thank you for your eternal wisdom of uh, just reminding us something that lasts for millennia of who you are, why you came, what you've done for us in worship. God, um, you know, as we come and take communion today, just um, let us do this as an act of praise to you, an act of worship. We give this time to you in the name of Christ.